Well, good morning, everyone. Um, let me take you into the future. And if there is a single thing I want you to take out of my presentation, like literally you can forget everything I'm going to tell you about the next 40 minutes. But the one thing I want you to take with you and keep in your mind is this. Tomorrow will be dramatically different than today. And when I say tomorrow, I'm not saying tomorrow five years from now. I'm taking tomorrow 24 hours from now. And I'm going to show you why that is. But before we get there, we need to talk a little bit about what we call this weird idea of the exponential disruption. And you hear me talk about this term exponential quite a bit, so let me unpack this a little bit for you. If you remember your math class, I think in Germany it's like, I don't know, when you were like 13, probably 14? An exponential trend looks like this. It's a doubling every time period. It's what we call the hockey stick curve. So it goes from 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, and so on. Uh, if you ever want to pitch a startup to us here in Silicon Valley, this is your revenue slide. So by all means, take a picture. And of course, the most important exponential trend we have, and probably best known, is Moore's Law. So Gordon Moore, 50 years ago, by observing the past, said that what I've seen was that the number of transistors on an integrated circuit doubles every two years. And I believe this to be true for the next 10 to 20 years. Now, Moore's law is true for the last 50 years. And in layman's terms, what Moore's law simply says is that your computer at the same price point gets twice as fast every two years. And of course, you know this because you need to buy a new iPhone every year. And two years later, for sure, your iPhone feels like a very, very old piece of technology. Let me show you how this looks like in the real world. So computing currently goes into two interesting ways. It bifurcates. It gets huge. It gets super computing scale. And to give you a feeling for this, this computer was released in 1997. It's called ASCII Red. It's the size <coughs> roughly of this room here. It was $55 million to procure. Uh, was used at the Sandia National Lab. It was the very first computer in the world to break through the teraflop barrier. So this is one trillion floating point operations per second. It's an incredibly powerful computer. And they used this computer to do weather calculations as well as simulate the radioactive fallout of a potential third world war. So this is 1997. Nine short years later, you go into an electronic store, you buy, buy a Sony PlayStation 3, costs you $499, has 2.1 teraflops. So within basically nine years, you go from a nation state simulates World War III to you and your kids are now playing World War III on a big screen television. And then computing goes super small. So computing goes into what we call the Internet of Things. This here is Pi Zero. If you've ever played with this guy, it's like around for a little while. It costs you $5. Uh, it's a full-scale computer. You can put into this computer a monitor, a keyboard, a mouse, and some memory, and you can run Windows on this thing, again, for five US dollars. If you put that into perspective, for the price of a Venti Starbucks latte, at least in the US, you now get two and a half times the compute power of a Cray-1. A Cray-1 was released in the mid-70s. Each of these Cray-1s had more compute power than all of NASA had combined to put the man on the moon. So literally for the cup of a coffee, the price of a cup of coffee, you now get two and a half times the compute power we had to put the man on the moon. Now you need to believe that we ever put a man on the moon, but I leave that to a different discussion. And then it gets super small. This is a golf ball, a dimple in a golf ball. That chip there is 2 millimeters by 1.6 millimeters. The full-scale computer, effectively, costs you 75 cents. That's the reason why everything, literally everything which has an electric cord attached to it, will become smart. There's absolutely no question about it. And the sole answer, the sole reason to that, is because you get it for free. It doesn't cost you anything anymore. Now, that you know, but I want to show you something different. This is uh, Ray Kurzweil, one of our co-founders, and he formulated something called the Law of Accelerating Returns. It's a little bit of a dense uh, paper, so I want to spare you the details, but I want to show you a graph, which is probably the most important graph which you have never seen before, and it's this here. So what Ray did is he looked at data points, and he was curious about the, a simple question. The question was, how stable are these trends over really long periods of time? And what he found is, by looking at the slightly different number, so he didn't look at number of transistors, because that only works in the age of transistors. He looked at how many calculations can I perform per one second per $1,000 of that year's money. 
And what you'll see is the black dots are data, actual data points, verified data points, is, and this is a logarithmic graph, is that for 110 years, the underpinnings of Moore's law have been true. As we go from technology to technology to technology, so we go from transistors to, from integrated circuits back to transistors to uh, tubes to electromechanical computing, it has been true for 110 years. And it's incredibly smooth. So in this time period, we had wars and economic up and downturns. It stays still stays absolutely smooth. The reason why this is important is very simple. You can take this and you can make a very good estimated guess into the future. And the guess into the future is the question, when do we have a computer, a single machine, which is affordable and has the raw compute power of a human brain? And when you look at this graph and you extrapolate it out, you will find that this will happen in 12 years. In 12 years from now, we will have a, an affordable computer which has the raw compute power of a human brain. And then Moore's law tells us two years later, we've got two human brains in a computer. And at 4, 8, 16, until 2050 to 2060, when we've got 7 billion brains in one machine. That is to say, tomorrow will look very different than today. Tomorrow, your phone, the thing in your pocket, will be smarter than you are. Now, my wife tells me that's true for me today. But that's a different story. So here's why this matters. It matters because we see these exponential trends in other industries, partially driven because a lot of industries are now driven by information technology, partially driven because we see the same trends in other industries in other physical realms. Let me show you three interesting aspects of this. First one is this here, energy. So today, energy is carbon-based. We burn fossil fuels, uh, gold, uh, uh, coal, gas, and oil. The future of energy is renewable. There's absolutely no question about it. Solar is one example. For a very simple reason, price performance. Solar in the 70s was $80 a kilowatt hour. To give you a perspective, the intermarket price, when you are a utility, a power utility, and you buy energy on the free market today, that price is about eight cents a kilowatt hour. So this is way, way, way too expensive. But then solar pricing came down, largely, by the way, because Germany invested heavily into solar. So solar prices came down and came down and came down, and they moved on an exponential curve. And in 2015, the price in California was 30 cents without any subsidies. So the first time in California, this is the same price we pay in California for coal-based energy, which is the dirtiest form of energy. So we are now producing energy at the same price as coal for 30 cents a kilowatt hour. That price is now true in 30 countries around the world. A year later, Dubai announced that they're building an 800 megawatt facility where the price of energy is 3 cents a kilowatt hour. I'm working with Inogy, which is the former RWE company out of uh, Northern Westphalia. Their CEO is on the record to say that they think energy will be free by 2040. They will not sell you energy anymore. There's an interesting aspect to energy, which is this. This is work from a German PhD who calculated that if we're building a solar panel, in theory, a solar panel the size of what you see on the left-hand side, which is called Welt, this is all it takes to power the world's energy consumption. I mean, this is in theory because you need to transport the energy. That's a different story. But this is a really interesting way because we live in a world where we see the world as a world of scarcity. We build our business models on the idea that there's only so much of something. Whereas in reality, if we leverage technology, we can get to a world of abundance. And the world will look very different when we get there. Let me show you another example. This one gets a little weird. Let's talk about DNA, genetics. DNA has two components to it. The one is reading DNA, sequencing. The other one is writing DNA, which is uh, a technology, a new technology called CRISPR-Cas9. I want to focus on reading, again, for a very simple reason, which is price performance. The first time we decoded a full human genome, one whole human genome, 3.2 billion base pairs was 1999. Seven years of effort, seven years. Cost us $2.7 billion, it was a multinational effort. It was called the Human Genome Project. This was revolutionary. It was the biggest step forward for mankind that we could take a whole genome and sequence it. Make an estimated guess in your head how expensive this is today. $2.7 billion, 18 years ago. Today, the price is $100. 
and it takes about 60 minutes. Now, I work with entrepreneurs, and I teach them two important questions. I teach you the same question today to you, which is when you look at price performance costs, and this is the cost of sequencing a genome, which is falling six times the rate of Moore's law at the moment, you want to ask yourself two important questions. The first is, where does this go? Because we know it's $100. By the way, three months ago, when I did the same session, the price was at $1,000. So we went from $1,000 already to $100. And you ask experts, and they will tell you, sequencing a human genome will become very close to free in the next 10 years. Pennies, literally pennies. And then the second question is, what do you do with this? What do you do with this technology? Well, I show you an example. And this is a pretty wild one. So on one hand, you will use genetics, genetics to do personalized medicine, to do diagnostics. Uh, to create new species on this planet, to allow us to grow food in areas where we couldn't grow food. But technology has a really interesting, weird, dark side. And this here is a friend of mine, a New York-based artist called Heather Dewey Hogboard. And she has an art project, and I let Heather talk about herself. We don't know yet how our DNA might be used against us in the future. <laughs> New York artist Heather Dewey Hagborg. One artist in New York is making 3D models of people's faces, people that she's never met. She calls the project Stranger Visions. The strangers are people whose genetic material she finds on the sidewalks and subways of New York City. How much can I actually find out about you from something that you accidentally leave behind? So let me just unpack what you saw there. Heather is literally picking up cigarette butts on the streets of New York. On a cigarette butt is your saliva. In your saliva is your DNA. She extracts the DNA out of the saliva using a technology the FBI is using for the last 20 years. If you're watching CSI on television, you know about that. And then she's putting it into the sequencing machine I just showed you for $100, sequences the genome, and then works with a very advanced genetics testing lab to reconstruct your facial features. Because, of course, your facial features are encoded in your DNA. The color of your eyes, the color of your hair, the shape of your skull, everything is in your DNA. She then takes that data, puts it into a 3D model, and prints these 3D masks. Again, that is to say we are moving rapidly into a world where tomorrow will look so dramatically different than today. Here's the interesting thing which I find like, probably disturbing about this. There is not a legal framework which keeps Heather from doing that. More importantly, there's not even a moral or ethical framework we have developed. My dear friend Sven, uh, whom you saw earlier, uh, he and I have a deal where if you drink out of a paper cup and throw it away today, we will take your paper cup, sequence the DNA, and I can tell you to one level behind the comma, one digit behind the comma, what your chance of becoming Alzheimer's is based on your DNA. If I'm nefarious, I take that DNA and send it to China and create a clone of you. We're moving into a world that looks so dramatically, weirdly different. Let me show you one more example. This is AI. Artificial intelligence. And of course you know AI from stuff like IBM Watson where IBM Watson is now better at detecting cancers on a CT and MRI scan than human beings. When you go to the Mayo Clinic in the US, which is the most advanced um, hospital in the US, they use Watson because Watson has an 85% chance of detecting something on a scan, whereas a human being only has a 50% chance. We have seen Google AlphaGo compete in the game of Go which is the most complex game humans have ever invented. The amount of moves on a Go game is larger than all the atoms existing in the universe. It is not a game you can play by a computer doing brute force. It is a game you need to play by intuition. Google ch challenged the world champion in five matches and won four of them. And then you've got Deep Dream, which is this weird AI taking in the arts of the world and creating these LSD-infused new pieces of art. It's kind of weird, not my cup of tea. But here's the thing. There's a good argument to say that AI will be the last invention we as humans ever make. And the reason for that is simple. 
Every technology we have ever invented moves on an S-curve. It starts out slowly, accelerates, and then it kind of peters out. Take electrification. We started with electrifying a few things. Then we started electrifying more and more and more and more things. And we came to the world where we have electrified can openers. God knows why we need them. And then it slows down. It goes flatter, and we get only get to marginal gains. AI is a technology which the more you use it, the more data you feed it, the better it will get. Thus, AI will be the only technology we've ever known which gets better and better and better and better without an end in sight. And in the future, we will just feed our problems to AI, and AI will develop those solutions. But it creates interesting, weird situations. This is work from a German, P uh, sorry, from a Chinese group of PhDs. This is published work. What they did is they took 750 pictures of Chinese inmates, people who are in prison, 750. And then they took a control group of 750 just ordinary Chinese people. And then they fed this into a facial recognition algorithm. This is the same algorithm you use for biometric scanning. So if you ever walk through a passport control thing, that's the same thing. And then they asked the AI a simple question. They asked the AI, can you detect, based on the facial features, if a person is a criminal or not? It's a weird thing, right? It's even a weird question to ask, because of course not. Well, the AI could, with an 89% accuracy, tell you if you're a criminal or not, based on your picture. So if you, if you happen to want to be in the criminal business, if you want to like, run a crime ring or something, I recommend uh, plastic surgery because you fool the AI. But it's wild, right? If you've seen um, Minority Report, this is like, what is it in our faces which we can't see but an AI can detect to tell me that I'm more likely to be a criminal than not? It's a weird world. So here's the challenge. Albert Allen Bartlett, who was like probably the grand master of exponential thinking, uh, taught at UC Boulder in Colorado, one said, the greatest shortcoming of the human race is our inability to ex understand the exponential function. What he means with this is very simple. As we grew up as humans over the last 300,000 years when we crawled out of our caves, the world around us is linear. The world we perceive is linear. The day has 24 hours, the seasons come and go. The world is a very linear place for us. We are really good at understanding linear trends. Here's a simple example, and you can do this with me. Imagine you take 30 linear steps, one step after the other. If you do this and I ask you how far do you get, you know how far you get, right? It's about 30 meters. And if I were to ask you how far is 30 meters, you could point in space. And the reason why we are so good at this is when we lived on the savannah with a sable-toothed tiger, it was important for us that if we saw the tiger at the end of the savannah to know if we need to hide or run or attack. Now imagine you take 30 exponential steps. We are moving on a technology curve. Every step is twice as far. 1, 2, 4, 8, 16. You do this 30 times. How far do you get? I will not ask you. But check in with yourself. How far do you get? I even give you the formula. It's 2 to the power of 30. It's a billion meters, 25 times around planet Earth. It's to the moon back from the moon and halfway to the moon again. It demonstrates two important things. The one is, when something moves on an exponential curve, it goes from 30 to a billion. The other one is, we are not well equipped to understand these trends in our gut. And that makes it dangerous, because you get to a world which looks like this. Technology moves on an exponential curve. Our thinking is linear. Three important points in this curve. The first one is this, which we call disappointment. Technology in the beginning is pretty crappy, and we want it to be better. And we're disappointed if it's not good. Any one of you has played with Google Glass. So I used to be at Google when we released Google Glass. I was wearing Google Glass for three months. And let me tell you, Google Glass is too expensive. The battery life is terrible. The features are pretty mediocre. And you look like a complete idiot wearing it. So what happens is you're disappointed. And the most people, when they're disappointed, they're dismissing it. They say, it's not good, it will not be good. But then you get to this moment when Steve Jobs gets on stage and shows you 10 years ago the iPhone. And when he shows you the iPhone, suddenly everything changes. Because now a phone isn't a phone anymore, it's a mini computer. Now a phone doesn't have buttons anymore, it's glass. 
And then you get to chaos and amazement, where you can't keep up with the world anymore, where you, you just are in amazement and, and uh, extraordinary distraught because the world is so wild. I want to talk a bit about this disappointment thing, and I don't want to talk about crying hipsters. I want to talk about something else. I want to talk about this. So any one of you is using Google's, uh, sorry, uh, Apple Siri, Google Now, Cortana, or Alexa. It's pretty magical, right? Like the idea that you talk to your phone is amazing. I mean, this is Star Trek. And in a lot of ways, it's not good enough yet. In a lot of ways, it sounds a lot like this. What time is my appointment on Sunday evening? You have four appointments last Tuesday at 12 a.m. I said, what time is my appointment on Sunday evening? You have four appointments last Tuesday at 12 a.m. I'm not asking about Tuesday. I don't know what you mean by, I'm not asking about Tuesday. How about a web search for it? So classic Siri fail. Now here's the interesting thing. When I look at Siri, what I see is a seven-year-old child. Siri is only seven years old. Now, what if I tell you that Siri and Google Now and Cortana and Alexa, they're currently doubling in capacity every year. They're moving on an exponential curve every single year. And now I'm asking you, how good is Siri as a young teenager? How good is Siri in seven years? And you ask people, I mean, check in again with yourself. Like, how good is it? It's not 10 times as good. It's not 20 times as good. It's going to be 128 times as good. And now is a challenge. What does that even mean? Like, what does it mean if Siri is 128 times as good? Well, I don't know. Well, I can tell you what you need to do. You need to break it down to first principles. You need to say, what is Siri made of? And Siri is three things. Speech recognition, what do you say? Speech cognition, what do you mean? And then lastly, a bunch of services it connects to. You extrapolate those out by 100, and you will find that in seven to 10 years, Siri will be better than any human being in understanding you. In 10 years, you will just talk to your computer, and your computer will understand you. And then the question becomes, what does this mean for us? Well, I can tell you, if you run a call center today, it's gone, because you don't need call centers anymore, because Siri will do it for you. I was recently working with a, a German car manufacturer, and to protect their innocence, they shall go unnamed. And they showed me the car dashboard for their new high-end class car. And it's beautiful. It's like wood, you know, wood paneling, big screen, whole bunch of buttons, a joystick. And I looked at this, and I was like, when does this go into production? I said, well, it's coming next year. They were really excited. And I was like, how long does it stay in production? I said, seven years. And I was like, you realize that I don't need a car dashboard anymore. In the future, if I want to play the radio, I just go into my car and say, hey, car, play the radio. And the radio will say, hey, I know you like this particular show. Shall I play it for you? And also, the act of forgetting will be gone. Today, I can go to my wife and say, hey, honey, I forgot to bring the milk. Tomorrow, Siri will yell at me and say, Pascal, I told you three times on your way back that you should pick up the milk. Right? We're moving into a world which looks so weirdly different. Here's your insight. It's not even that hard, but it's so fundamental. Once you take something from analog to digital, once you digitize it, it moves on an exponential curve. The biggest business opportunities in this life is when you find something which was analog and you turn it into digital. The reason why Silicon Valley invests into two particular industries, all its money, it's pretty clear because they are analog businesses. We're investing all our money into healthcare, largely an analog business, and we invest all our money into agricultural technology, farming, trillion dollar business, largely analog. So what we have to do, though, is we have to look at the big picture. Like, I can geek out about technology literally all day long, and it's fun, but it really doesn't matter all that much. What matters is what happens in the world. And Albert Einstein, about 25 years ago, I read this quote. He said, we shall require a substantially new manner of thinking if mankind is to survive. It freaked me out when I read this. And of course, he means this in the, in the spirit of the uh, nuclear proliferation. But it freaked me out. If you think about the big problems in the world today, we've got climate change, which will lead to massive 
amounts of people not only having weird weather patterns, but massive amounts of people needing to move because their land will become inhabitable. If you think about this, three billion people who live on less than two and a half dollars a day. There's two and a half billion people who don't have access to proper sanitation, making diarrhea one of the most prevalent killers in the world. You've got about 800 million people who have no access to clean drinking water, or 750 million people who can't read or write. There's a child dying every eight seconds because of malnutrition in a world where we in the first world die of obesity. It's a weird world. I think what we have to do is we have to tackle these problems. I've got the interesting opportunity to work with the US Navy SEALs, which is a very, very interesting uh, world. And the US Navy SEALs have a, a, a formula in one of their handbooks. So they give the young Navy SEALs, which they call baby SEALs, a handbook. In this handbook, you'll find a formula. And that formula says your rate of growth. And what they mean is your personal growth, you as an individual. Your rate of growth equals the magnitude of the challenge multiplied by the intensity of the attack. If you believe that to be true, and I fundamentally believe this to be true, why wouldn't you take the hardest problem you can find in the world and attack it as hard as you can because that's how you grow. And what do you care more as a human being than growing? Life is growing. The Irish playwright George Bernard Shaw once wrote, the reasonable man adapts himself to the world, the unreasonable one persists in trying to adapt the world to himself. Therefore, all progress depends on the unreasonable man and woman. If there's a thing I wish for you, just personally, is you have to be unreasonable. We all have to be unreasonable. It's the only way we will change this world for the better. And it's the only way we can make these problems literally go away. Because we can. Technology allows us to do so. We just need to choose to do so. This is my last slide, and here's the important message. I get these questions all the time, like, what's the future look like? And I tell you, I don't know. I literally do not know. What I do know is that the future is unwritten. It has not been done. It's not there yet. It is on us to create this future. We are determining how this future will look like. The most, the most relevant part here is that if you're not doing this, the future will happen to you. But we are empowered to do so. So go out and change the future, change the world to whatever you want it to be because it's on us. And we're at this interesting, weird intersection point where the technology will, like, the lines are crossing and the world will look so dramatically different tomorrow than it does today. My very last slide. If you want to stay in touch, if you want to have a copy of all these slides, if you want to have a video version of this here, and I'm sure my friends from Group M will make this available uh, as a video as well. But if you want to, plus all my contact details, I'm a very sociable person, it's there. So head over there. And with that, thank you so much.